Good, up, good morning, everyone. Um, sorry for the short delay. A warm welcome to the fourth in our summer series of online Claver events. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ian Rees, and I am chair of Claver, the Welsh People's History Society. Hopefully, a number of you have already taken part in our previous three events on memorialization in Wales, the Welsh anti-apartheid movement, and Wales and slavery. For anyone who missed any of these three fascinating discussions, audio recordings will be available imminently, free of charge, via the Slava website. So do have a listen. Our online series continues today with a talk by Neil Evans, a Slava stalwart of many years standing, who has made a massive contribution to our society as variously chair, secretary, and joint editor. He is currently an honorary research fellow at Bangor University. Having myself had the privilege of being taught by Neil for two years uh, long ago at Colleg Harley, I know that he is someone who speaks always with wisdom and always with insight. So I'm sure we're all looking forward to what he has to say today. The title of Neil's presentation is Crossing the Colour Line, Empire, War and Racial Violence, 1900 to 1925. It will focus primarily on the Cardiff race riots of 1919, although Neil will be setting them in the context of Welsh involvement in the empire and the changes in the international situation after the collapse of slavery in the Atlantic world. Neil will be making use of images and quotations from original sources. Please be aware that some of these sources use highly offensive language, which is included in the presentation for the sake of historical authenticity. Of course, Neil is an acknowledged expert on the subject of race relations in Wales. He published an account of the South Wales race riots in Clava uh, the Flava Journal 40 years ago, has maintained a strong interest in immigration and minorities in modern Wales ever since. He is co-editor, along with Charlotte Williams and Paul O'Leary, of the book A Tolerant Nation, a key work on this topic. Just before I hand over to Neil, a few housekeeping issues. Please ensure that you have your cameras turned off and microphones muted. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. If you would like to ask Neil a question, please type it into the chat facility at any time during the talk. And a selection of these questions will be posed to Neil by James Phillips, our event secretary, after Neil has spoken. So without further delay, I'm going to hand you over to Neil. Neil, a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. A very kind introduction. It was a great pleasure to teach you as well. Um, right, as Ian said, I'm going to talk mainly about what happens in, or centrally, about what happened in Cardiff in June 1919. But Cardiff was a global city. It was an imperial city. So to understand it, we need to put those events into a wider context and I'm going to try to do that when we start. Just to emphasize what Ian has already said, uh, I'm talking about a time which is a hundred years and more ago um, and when racist language was even more common than it is now. It's very hard to avoid it and I've, I've done what other people do in these circumstances is to give a, a warning at the beginning that there are very, very offensive words periodically. Okay, could we go to the next slide please? My, my title really comes from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, that's how Americans pronounce it and probably how he pronounced it, even though some of us might think that's an odd way to do it. At the beginning of the 20th century, he wrote a brilliant book, uh, The Souls of Black Folk. And he announced in that, as you can see on the screen, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. 
the relation of the darker and race, lighter races of men in Asia, Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea. What might he have been thinking about around that time, 1903? Well, it was only about, it was less than 10 years since slavery had finally ended in the Western Hemisphere in, in Cuba in 1895. Um, it was in that context, Du Bois' own father had been a slave. It is also America, where he came from, was shifting from its continental imperialism waged against Native Americans and Mexicans to overseas possessions with the Spanish-American War of um, 1898, taking territories in the Philippines and in, uh, in the Caribbean. At the same time, China was entering its great period of uh, decline and the major powers wanted to carve it up. The Americans wanted an open door policy, which meant they would be favored there, uh, technically open to everybody, but the biggest and closest power would dominate and that meant America. The European powers wanted to do what they'd just done to Africa in the, tw the previous 20 years, carve that up amongst themselves, but that uh, was denied them in China. But by 1900, with the exception of Ethiopia, the whole of Africa had become the possession of imperial powers. Du Bois was one of the people who was beginning to lead a fight back against that. In 1900 in London, there was the first Pan-African Congress, uh, which he attended and did a lot to organize. And um, that was where the movements were really back across the Atlantic in the other opposite direction. People back to Africa and back to um, Britain and the, the major imperial powers to create alliances of black people across the globe. In 1910, Du Bois would be one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in the United States, one of the earliest civil rights uh, movements there. So what's on the horizon is civil rights and colonial liberation. Can we go to the next, please? In Wales, we often tend to think of Wales as a kind of imperial victim, or at least as somewhere where people were strongly against empire. And we can find examples of that. Henry Richard in his long parliamentary career and before that was a fairly fervent opponent of imperialism. Um, and you can see on the screen there, he didn't pull his punches about it. There's scarcely a country whose soil we have not manured with human flesh, scarcely a sea whose waters we have not crimsoned with human blood. But, next slide please. In the later 19th century in particular, the younger Welsh MPs, younger politicians, tended to move towards Wales being a part of the empire. If um, England had the lion's share of empire, there was a claim being made for the dragon's share. Wales needed its place in the imperial sun. The younger politicians, like the two Herberts, Roberts and Lewis in North Wales, David Lloyd George and um, Tom Ellis, of course, were interested in Wales as a place of um, at the, at making Wales in the imperial centre. On the screen, you've got a comment Lloyd George made in a meeting in Cardiff in 1908 about how Wel Welsh patriotism fitted into the empire and had no um, hostility to empire built into it. The empire was founded by a Welsh dynasty. The greatest things in the world have been done by small nations. No mean thing was ever cradled amongst mountains. And it goes on and on in those ways. We tend to think of David Lloyd George for his opposition to the Boer War, but overall in his career, he was very much pro-imperialist. Can we move on please? <clears throat> Sorry, next slide. <clears throat> Thanks. One of the other connections <clears throat> was through missionary activity. In 1890, this um, institution, the Congo Institute, later became the African Institute in Colwyn Bay, was established by um, 
John Hughes, a um, missionary who had been in the Congo and had decided that it was too dangerous for white people to go there because the climate um, killed them very quickly. So he would bring Africans to Colwyn Bay, conveniently close to Liverpool, where he could use the Elder Dempster um, stripping line of Newcastle, of, of, sorry, Liverpool, uh, not Newcastle, um, to uh, move people back and forth between Congo and, um, and Colwyn Bay. And there he would train them to become missionaries amongst their own peoples. Uh, for nearly 20, for 20 years, they were an exotic site in the town, uh, seemed to have been reasonably welcomed, and they travelled around Wales. Many people would have seen the, uh, the boys and the young men that lived there because they were used to raise funds for the Institute. But can we go to the next one, please? But it all came unstuck in 1911, and the issue is one which I want to flag up for later. <clears throat> what happened was there was an accusation, which seems to have been true, that one of the students had impregnated a local woman, and this was taken up by the uh, racist publication John Bull, which ran a campaign against it, and eventually the Congo Institute collapsed in 1912 in a, in a court case. It's not the only reason it collapsed, it had financial problems. But this is a, a key issue. Uh, interracial sex, particularly when it involved a black man and a white woman. In colonial situations, it was the other way around, and that was often tolerated. But it was a problem, seen as a problem, in Wales in the period. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? I think we also need to see, say something about the popular culture of Wales in the period. These are slides from the interwar period uh, of um, kazoo bands, um, gazooka bands, and uh, they seem to have largely started in 1926, but it was a deep tradition in the 19th century of, of doing blackface um, musical presentations and acts in the music hall. It's, it's difficult to uh, understand what was in people's minds. Sometimes it seemed to be related to anti-slavery activity and to identifying with black people. Very often I think it was uh, indicating a sense of so-called superiority over these people. These are some photographs from the interwar period which uh, Steve Thompson who's working on this uh, very kindly gave me. Now we'll move on to Cardiff finally. I've been talking for a while and haven't yet got to Cardiff. Could we have the next slide please? Cardiff was an international port in the 19th century. From the 1850s at least, sailors from all nations um, started to um, dock there and to come ashore. In the era of the sailing ship, they were largely Europeans. You can see what's left of that really in the Norwegian church in Cardiff. Norwegians were famed for, you, you could hire them as an ordinary seaman and they could do the work of a ship's carpenter, which was paid more. And they uh, and others like Scandinavians formed settlements in Cardiff. And as we shift to the steamship era, from about the 1870s onwards. Increasingly, there are people from the empire and from overseas um, areas, um, not from Europe, out, outside Europe, who are coming in as essentially stokehold crews in those, um, those steam-powered vessels. Many different nationalities, you have people who were referred to at the time as Arabs, Somalis, um, and um, <clears throat> Chinese in very small numbers. And by 1900, a retired sea captain called W.R. Ward was running campaigns against them in a very nasty publication called the Maritime Review. I could quote him uh, for a long time, but uh, it's very sickening. And on the screen, you can see uh, what he thought about this. The rakings and scrapings of every Asiatic doss house or beach fill an empty niche in our maritime economy and their presence is not only a danger to the nation but a positive disgrace. 
if you'd read novels at the time, you might have read the Imperial Adventure novels of G. A. Henty. And in one of his books, he offered the opinion that the the intelligence of the average Negro is about equal to a European child of 10 years old. This was the context for a lot of people at the time. Could we move to the next slide, please? Next one, please, James. Yeah, thanks. It became a particular issue in 1911. The Siemens Union had been organized first in 1889 and won victories, but had been defeated by the counterattack of the Shipping Federation in the middle of the 1890s. The seamen wanted to reorganize um, when they could, and the opportunity seemed to present itself in the Edwardian period. So, going to sea was inherently a multinational occupation. There were Europeans in British ships, there were people from the Empire. And the Seamers Union recognised when it tried to organise in 1911 that it would have to admit uh, British citizens of colour and Europeans. But what it kept out of the Union was the Chinese. It used those as a scapegoat. They weren't allowed to join. There's a cartoon from the Siemens Union Journal, and it makes the point. All the Europeans are coming out and they're going into the workhouse and all the Chinese are uh, coming onto the ship. And when the great strike broke out in Cardiff in 1911, it was solid across um, ethnic lines, apart from the Chinese who were banned from joining the Union. Could you have the next slide, please? But at some point in the strike, the Shipping Federation brought some Chinese seamen in as, uh, ship, as strike breakers. And here's a picture of them coming in. It was something which the Seamen's Union was able to exploit because it made a big agitation about that. And it used it as an issue to bring out the dockers to support them and to create a general strike in Cardiff in the summer of 1911, very violent general strike. And what it was really about was mobilizing the dockers so they could win the strike. And could we go on please? Next slide. And of course it led to the attacks on Chinese laundries which were very much a part of the strike. Uh, 29 of them destroyed in one night. The one they'd missed got on the following night. 30 Chinese laundries, which had nothing to do with the strike, um, but they were just using a, an issue of racial antagonism in order to um, win their cause. Uh, right, could we go on, please? When the war broke out, in 1914, it made obviously massive social changes. It scattered people across the globe. It changed their normal locations. Sebastian Conrad says it was World War I that displaced millions of people to faraway shores, battlefields and graveyards, and created global experiences that left indelible wounds. As far as shipping was concerned, it was particularly important that it was, as Avner Offer um, argued many years ago, that uh, it was not only a war of steel and gold, but a war of bread and potatoes. It was essentially, <clears throat> apart from on the battlefields of the, West, of the Western Front, which is mainly what we think about when we think about the First World War, it's generally our first image, but of course it was very much fought in the North Sea with the British blockade of Germany, which was critical in winning the war in the end, and the German U-boat boat campaigns in the Atlantic. Could you move on, please? Next slide. There are some images from artists. Rationing was introduced in Britain for the first time in 1917. There were food shortages. People depended on the Navy, the Merchant Navy, for their supplies. Could we move on? Now, what happened during the war was that many merchant seamen, British 
white ones in particular, moved into the Royal Navy. <clears throat> there was still a need for merchant shipping, which was really the front line as much as anything else in winning the war. And while there had been people of colour in the workforce before the First World War, the numbers very clearly expanded there in, in the war itself. <clears throat> Particularly people were recruited from the West Indies and from the Middle East. And uh, they were, of course, in a position of great danger. Um, it, no, so could we go back to that? This is the crew of the steamship um, Ho um, Hope Mount, sunk by U-35 off Lundy on the 13th of June 1915. These are the people who were rescued. It had sailed from Cardiff, although it was registered in Newcastle, and it was, um, it was bound for um, Alexandria. Uh, but the U-boat sunk it with its gun rather than waste a torpedo on it, sunk a, to a, a schooner at the time. It was a highly dangerous occupation. In 1919, the Western Mail um, said that a, a thousand black sailors um, sailing out of Cardiff had been killed in the war. Now, some people have made fun of this observation, saying, well, there were only 700 there at the beginning of the war. Can't possibly be true. But that misunderstands the nature of the shipping industry and the great turnover of people. The Cardiff police argued <clears throat> that half a million aliens had passed through um, Cardiff in the course of the First World War. Their figure may be exaggerated, but it's easily possible for a thousand black people um, <clears throat> sailing from Cardiff to have been killed in the war. Remember how dangerous it is when we come to look at the riots. Can we go to the next one, please? The war created what we might think of as a sort of imperial melting pot. Generally speaking, the peoples of the empire, Britain's empire was you know, very broad and very diverse, but they usually didn't come into contact with each other very much. They were effectively segregated across the globe in many respects. The war changed all this. This is what Christopher Bailey says in his remarkable book on the world economy. <clears throat> One of the long-term consequences of the war was the result of unprecedented levels of social mixing, the mixing of classes, races, and nationalities. Australian troops in Egypt mixed with Arabs and upper-class British officers. <clears throat> They appreciated neither leading to the solidification of an Australian self sense of selfhood centered on white mateship and a going, growing distrust of the supposed uh, class-ridden stagnation of British society. Not sure it was supposed. Um, black workers from the French, uh, African and Caribbean societies were recruited into French factories to replace men called to the front and the relationship with white women caused deep unease. Can we go on, please? There's some senses of that unease. In East St. Louis, in 1917, there was a horrendous race riot. Um, dozens, dozens, possibly a hundred um, black people killed. Um, there was a great fear that there'd be something like a slave revolt amongst the black population. You have to remember that they're now moving from plant, former plantations in the south into uh, northern cities and uh, midwestern cities like St. Louis, and uh, sometimes getting quite well-paid job in the packing industry and uh, the steel industry, say, in Chicago. And this was something which was um, building up resentment amongst white people. Um, there's a, an image from... France uh, alongside it, where, as the last quotation showed, um, French colonial subjects were coming in, partly as seamen, but also to work in munitions factories and racist agitations. White sister, black brother, it says ominously. And, you, well, you look at the imagery on their faces. Could we go to the next slide, please? The war 
transformed the economy of South Wales in important ways. Of course, it was an, an export coal field and with mountain um, coal um, production and exports right up to 1913. But the war made it impossible to follow all the old lines of trade and it meant that there were new uses for coal and it all had to be shifted out of the tracks on which it had all been running before. So you can see there significant decline in the output of the coal field, uh, lost 10 million tonnes in the course of the war, and uh, particularly proportionately in the exports from, um, from South Wales, uh, down to 20 million tonnes from 30 million in 1913, and had been even lower in 1917. At the end of the war, in November 1918, or technically, of course, when the Treaty of Versailles was, formed, uh, was signed the next summer, um, the economic situation got worse in the South Wales ports. There was a slump in shipping, uh, as you can see still in those figures for coal exports, on top of that, there were many demobilized um, servicemen, sailors who'd been demobilized from the Navy and were looking for jobs again in the merchant service, and there were soldiers who didn't have jobs. Demobilization was very badly handled. It was generally on the principle of last in, first out, on the basis that uh, it was thought that if you'd recently had a job, it would be easier to re to uh, resume one, but people who'd survived the war and been in it for years were resentful that they'd been demobilized last. There was a lot of resentment amongst ex-servicemen and they were vocal uh, on the streets and in meetings in the South Wales ports in 1919. In the course of the war, possibly the minority ethnic population of Cardiff had doubled. We don't know, but that's a, a, a guesstimate based on some evidence. Could we have the next slide please? That's a picture of a, what the uh, Western Mail thought was a cross-section of them in 1919. Um, um, they described them as Arab, Portuguese, Cuban, African, West Coast and East Indies. Um, it, it was very diverse population in Cardiff. And as we'll see from the next slide, um, made up of, could we have the next one please? Um, made up of, predominantly of people from the Middle East. People described as Ad Arabs from the Aden Protectorate, 400 of them counted then, Somalis, um, 200, Egyptians from the same area, 50, and West Indians who we often think about as the population of Boot Town, were um, never a ma majority there by any means. And in the interwar period, the figures are more heavily skewed against them. Okay, could we go to the next slide, please? It, it was hard to get a map which captured something of that position. Because when I looked at all sorts of atlases, they tended to give you maps of the Middle East and they gave you maps of uh, Africa. And um, the point about Aden, as far as Cardiff was concerned particularly, was that it straddled that divide. You can see where Aden is, clearly. Aden was a protectorate of the British um, government, so it, uh, it conferred people who lived there certain rights. But there was also on the other side, uh, Somaliland divided between the colonial powers, between the French, the Italians and the British, um, from where many people went to Aden before they were then shipped to ports in Britain. Do you have the next slide, please? Now, the remarkable thing about this, that one of those people, Ibrahim Ishmael, um, wrote his autobiography in the 1920s and he described his life and the route which had taken him from uh, Somaliland to um, Cardiff. 
Um, born around 1896, it's a bit hard to work out from the chronology in his work. Worked in a whole series of unskilled and temporary jobs before First World War. But had heard that, you know, Aden was the place you went to. It was the El Dorado if you wanted to um, achieve something and get a decent job. From Aden, he went on to Marseille and ended up in Cardiff. Uh, just in time for the riots of 1919. He arrived pretty much as they were breaking out. And he continued to sail out of there in the 1920s. In the later 1920s, he was involved in this commune in Whiteway in Gloucestershire. And that's why we've got a picture of him. I know it's quite hard to see. And I've tried to put an arrow on it, which doesn't come um, very clearly. But there he is. We actually have a picture. He said, on the boat we had heard of a place called Cardiff, where there were many Somalis and plenty of ships, and where it was easy to get work. He got a train from London to Cardiff, taken into a, uh, to a boarding house by an Arab, looked after by the boarding master who gave him food and lodging on credit. Can we go on, please, the next slide? As, as he arrived... Um, there were conflicts breaking out in all the British ports. Riots had started from January 1919. The first of them in South Shields and in Glasgow in January 1919, then a more serious outbreak in South Shields in February. Um, there were outbreaks in the East End of London in uh, April 1919, and then... Um, a very serious and significant riot in Liverpool in May. In the course of that, one man, Charles Wooden, from the West Indies, was chased into a dock and then stoned and um, subsequently died, of course. Um, the riots seem really to have spread between the ports. Uh, the Western Mail predictably thought it was all a Bolshevik plot. But the important thing to recognize here is that sailors routinely um, moved between ports. Um, it was quite normal for Liverpool, which had a huge import trade, to be the place where sailors were paid off. And then they might take a train to Cardiff because Cardiff had a big export trade and it was easy to get a ship there. They moved between the ports in the normal course of things. But it was one of the things which could spread discontent. Yes. What sparked the trouble in Cardiff? Well, this always seems to me to symbolise it. Um, it's sometimes said that this is an image from the 1890s. I suspect it's 1919. And it's... it's encapsulates what the discontents in Cardiff in the period uh, were seen to be. Black people, people from the empire, had settled there in larger numbers. They had taken uh, jobs in the merchant marine, which was generally quite well paid in the war because the union won wage increases for them. It was suggested in 1919 that if they were paid off after a long voyage, they could come ashore with £50. That may have been exceptional, but I don't think it's impossible if you look at wages. That's very different from anyone who'd been in the army and the navy with their miserable pay during the war. And there was resentment about that. There was resentment that they'd taken houses and during the war, there'd been a moratorium on house building. There was virtually none at all. There rarely is in wars. And uh, there was a housing shortage. But as much as anything, if you remember back to the Congo Institute in 1911-12, um, there was the issue of interracial sex. This is what's encapsulated in that break. There are some prosperous um, people you know, they're well-dressed, they can hire a break, they've been out for a picnic, presumably, and um, they're displaying um, themselves for the camera. Now, in um, June 1919, that was the, 
the flashpoint for um, action in Cardiff. I should have said that, of course, there'd already been disturbances in um, Newport and Barry in the previous weeks. Um, the Friday before this incident in Newport, there'd been uh, some riots on the Friday night and the Saturday night um, when it was alleged that a black man had made an offensive comment to a white woman and um, fisticuffs broke out and then there were assaults on the black areas of Newport. Um, houses were ransacked, their belongings were piled into a, a heap and set alight and any black person out on the streets was set upon. They defended themselves, revolver shots were fired up in the air and a very nasty outbreak, particularly on the Friday. The Saturday, the um, 7th, less um, intense, but still a riot. And then the next Wednesday in Barry, uh, there was a similar kind of outbreak. Um, a black man called uh, Charles Emmanuel was walking down the street. Um, he uh, was he was told he should go down his own street. There was a fight. He was set upon by several people and he stabbed one of them who died. Uh, this led to riots in, Car in Barry uh, in, uh, on the 11th, followed by some less significant ones in, um, in the same town the next night. But what happened there was eclipsed by this incident in Cardiff. Somewhere around 10.30 in the evening, could we go to the next slide please? On the 11th of June, a break like that was making its way back uh, from a, an outing into Boot Town. And it reached here, uh, East Canal Wharf. Offensive comments were made by white bystanders to the people in the break. And it stopped and there was an altercation. And very quickly, they lined, the people lined up on either side of the bridge here. They were about 100 yards apart, um, throwing stones. Uh, the uh, black people defending themselves with um, Revolvers usually fired up into the air to deter people from coming and an incident broke out. But the incident itself, as we've seen, was very much about prosperity and about uh, interracial sex. <coughs> sex. Can we go to the next one? Yeah. At around the same time, according to the police, a man, um, Harold Smart, was murdered in Caroline Street. I guess we all know where Caroline Street is in Cardiff. Um, it was alleged that he was killed by a black man. There was no evidence for this and no one was ever convicted. But it's, it's very clear that whatever the truth of it was, that was a rumour that got poured into the pot um, for people who were inflamed already about racial issues. I think it's interesting in this Brains pub in Caroline Street that you can see all the recruiting posters for the war um, festooned on the, uh, the, the front of the building. I think one of the things which added to this information was that there'd been so much xenophobia and anti-German feeling in the course of the war that it translated into a general hostility to anyone who was different. It, it was always, of course, and rightly, the defense of people of color from the empire that they were British as much as people who had been born in the United Kingdom and they were imperial subjects. But that kind of distinction was blurred when much of society had been um, pontificating about Huns and their, their vile doings uh, for years during the war. And symbolically, that pub has the, uh, the posters um, <clears throat> pasted all over it. 
Next slide, please. Four days in all of conflict in Cardiff, the compensation that the city council had to pay was well over £3,000. Uh, these are some of the few images of the, um, the damage which was done. It's, a lot of it is to furniture and uh, possessions and windows, but in, in, case, <clears throat> in several cases, you know, the roofs were stripped and window frames were taken out in um, Newport. There was an attack on property in particular. And here we have um, Abdul Sattar's um, lodging house in uh, Butte Street. Can we have another pic the next picture, please? Rather delighted to find a picture of him in rather happier circumstances in 1950. Um, there he is captured in the front of that image. He'd moved by then to 238 Butte Street, but it's the same person. Could we go on, please? Next slide. There are many incidents. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> I was, that, sorry, I'm a bit taken aback. I was trying to put some um, image some uh, lines onto the screen and they weren't coming out when I was showing them um, on my screen last night so they're a bit of a mess but, but uh, there were many different incidents but generally speaking the riots happened in the evening at night uh, generally under cover of darkness they'd started at 10 o'clock they tended to be that time of night although um, people out on the streets in the centre of Cardiff and elsewhere could be attacked in daytime. But the assaults on Boot Town as a community tended to be in the evening. The worst uh, events were on the Thursday, the 12th of um, June, when two people died in two separate incidents. So I've, I've highlighted those as uh, the killing sites in Cardiff. And it's important to see just where they are. One of them perhaps is where we would expect it to be in Butte Street. That's where 264 was. It was there that a white crowd had pushed through the police cordon on Butte Town, um, partly by distracting them, attacked a boarding house, managed to smash their way in. And at the end of it, uh, a man described as Arab named Mohammed Abdullah uh, was left dead, the fractured skull. It was never proved who had killed him. The uh, assaulting um, crowd was followed very quickly by the police. The inquest afterwards couldn't decide whether it was a police baton or a, um, a chair leg which had killed him and the case remained open. But there you have the incident in Butte Street. Millicent Street, which is actually a little bit north of that. I, I couldn't see it very clearly. It's just down be, below the haze. It's, it's parallel, it's pretty much disappeared under St. David's too now, but it was pretty much parallel to Bridge Street um, then. And it was an area outside what was usually regarded as the area in which people of color had settled in Cardiff. Um, I think it's got something to do with the expansion of the community in the war and it expands outside Butte Town. If you follow the incidents around the city on a map, you'll find that many of them are actually outside Butte Town. I think what's going on is partly a process of trying to shift them back into an area where they were seen to belong as it were, but more about that in a minute. This is a much better map borrowed from Kenneth Little's book on Butte Town. Um, and this is what Abraham Ishmael um, said about the attacks on the boarding house in Millicent Street. Um, he wasn't allowed to go there and defend his um, tribe, the Wasengeli, as they were known. Um, because he was seen to be too young, too experienced. He'd never been in a fight like that, so they sent him somewhere they th thought should be safer. So he didn't observe it directly himself, but he was um, very much part of the incident. Little picks out in black there the areas which were 
those mainly settled in the 1930s by people of colour in Cardiff. There were very few then outside those boundaries. Could we go to the next, please? So underlying factors. Well, I think quite a lot is about territory in the city. Go down your own street was one comment. People in Butte Town talked about our quarter. The Times and George Sims earlier had other and more offensive um, descriptions of what Butte Town was. What had happened, I think, was that people of colour had crossed the colour line in the war. Uh, there were places where they were seen as being acceptable and there were places where they were seen as not being acceptable. But I think it's also significant that there were many colonial troops in Cardiff, especially Australians who seem to have led some of the attacks and to have uh, snipes with rifles. Uh, the war, in a sense, threw people together on the streets of Cardiff who would perhaps never have encountered people um, in other circumstances. It had mixed up those imperial project, um, subjects. Um, it's a phrase I came out with a few years ago. The empire made a cameo appearance on the streets of Cardiff. Um, something very different was happening. Could we go to the next, please? And underlying it, the people arrested in Newport were very vocal in what they said about their motivations. And this is what they said in courts. As we'll see, it's an issue about um, economics in many respects. Um, they feel that others have done well out of the war when they haven't. Of course, <laughs> always say, remember how dangerous it was to be a sailor <laughs> during the war. Um, and there's a sense that they haven't got their just rewards from the war. This is what one gets for fighting in the country, for the country. But there's a sense too that they are a community and they don't want these outsiders here. We can't get jobs. Um, we want to get these people who are different from us out of the place. And you can see the language in which that is expressed on the page. Can you go to the next, please? But of course, there was resistance. In Butte Town and in all the incidents, the people of colour defended themselves vigorously. They turned Butte Town into an armed camp. The police put a cordon around Butte Street and naively at first, I thought that was because they wanted to defend um, the, uh, the community in Butte Town. But I think it's clear from reading some of the police reports that what they were concerned about was defending property and they were afraid that if the white crowds had penetrated into Butte Town, there would have been slaughter because they were so well defended. You can say perhaps that the Cardiff police believed that white lives mattered and black lives were incidental in this context. Rufus Fennell, can we go back to the other one for, uh, for a minute, please, before we move on? Rufus Fennell led this um, campaign. He was, a was working as a dentist in Pontypridd. Uh, he came into Cardiff, he assumed leadership, and that is him almost certainly addressing a protest meeting in uh, Boot Street in, in the course of the riots. Um, I was told by James Ernest, a, a, an old man who I interviewed in 1978, that um, you know he was a big athletic man, six feet tall, and he strode up to City Hall to negotiate and in the middle of the riots and uh, no one dared touch him. Uh, that's not in any newspaper, but it's what somebody told me. Now, he's a man of mystery, could we? Or he was. Could we go on to the next one, please? I thought I'd never really see what he looked like. And then it's like London buses. Um, when you, you wait for one to come along, um, you know, two suddenly come at once. That's a picture of him from a newspaper of the time. 
And enough has now been established of his life that I can say something much more about him. He claimed to have been West Indian, but in fact he was from Georgia in the United States, although he probably had West Indian ancestry. Uh, he claimed to be medically trained, but there's no evidence for that. Um, he worked as various things, including a music hall artist. And um, in the interwar period, he was on the stage in London. Uh, he was in a couple of films and he wrote a film script, which was aimed at Paul Robeson, which, um, which was about ha Haiti in the early 20th century, uh, which sadly was never produced. Um, he led the campaigns of the people in Boot Town. And then not only did he do it in Cardiff, but he, he went to London to negotiate with the colonial office and the home office um, on behalf of the local community. You can see what some of those um, people in official positions in London said about him, an obstreperous uh, colored man from Cardiff and tractable and quite reasonable for a colored man. Um, but he, he was clearly a very powerful advocate of, um, of his cause. Um, as a consequence, I'll come to this in a minute, there was repatriation um, of, of, um, of, of people of color from Cardiff. Could we go to the next slide, please? The next month, there were even worse riots in Chicago. Dozens of people killed, something like 50 in the uh, riots in Chicago. And the remarkable thing about those is there are photographs of people actually being killed. You have to wonder about the photographer that does, takes a picture rather than does something about it. But the photograph on the bottom right is significant there. There are people loading up their possessions to move out of places where they're seen as not supposed to be. Territory in the city is very important here. Okay, can we go on then please? I'll try to speed up. This occurred in what was a huge crisis for the empire. British empire was huge but it, it didn't have too many troops police in it, and it had always survived on the basis that you needed just one crisis at a time. Now, I was going to list all the crises and conflicts in the empire in 1919, but it would have gone on for probably as long as I'm talking now. Just remember that Ireland's beginning, but not really got going, and Amritsa was three month, two months before um, the riots in Cardiff. So the empire is seething and there is a huge crisis there. The British government thinks to head off the conflict, it will repatriate people to the colonies. Hundreds went from British ports, I think about 600 in all, but it didn't end the conflicts. Uh, it transferred them into the empire. Um, there was a mutiny on board the steamship Orca, taking about 400 people from, um, uh, from Britain to the West Indies. And a, a story circulated in Trinidad about a black man's funeral in Cardiff. Uh, the story was that the funeral had been um, uh, stopped and uh, the, um, the corpse taken out of the coffin beheaded um, and... Um, you know, then everything resumed. Now, I've been told this story in Cardiff as well, but I've never found any evidence for it. But the significant thing is the story was told. In Trinidad, there were attacks on naval crews, and they were direct result of what had happened in Liverpool and Cardiff. In Belize, people said, this is our country, and we want to get the white man out. Uh, you might think that's the uh, answer to the comments in Newcastle. There were dock strikes, one of which um, crippled the empire. Could we go to the next one, please? Black politicians often made the point that the reality of the empire was that you couldn't treat people like that. And they had various figures. I'm not sure they add up as actual um, accounts of the empire, 
that they said, well, think about it, it's 450 million people and only 100 million of them are white, five out of seven are black, and think about what might happen. Um, <clears throat> The empire, I think, from the point of view of stability, <clears throat> had to appear to be equal and welcoming. Trade depended on free movement and a multi-ethnic workforce. And this is why, um, in 1925, I think, they introduced the notorious amendment to the Aliens Act, the Aliens Order of 1925, which classified many people of color, many sailors who were imperial subjects in Britain as aliens. They, they couldn't give favor to um, white people explicitly in the legislation, but they, um, they, they could pretend that they weren't imperial subjects and treat them like, en like aliens, enemies. That gave the police close control over them and of course, their identity card had fingerprints on them on the grounds which they really said well you need this because they all look alike next slide please are there more optimistic outcomes well uh, this is the the view of Nellie Guildford a Butte Town resident interviewed by the Butte Town History and Art Centre of um, fond memory uh, she said about Butte Town, we're all mixed up and we like it. Ibrahim Ishmael um, had a, describes later in his autobiography after a discussion with a Belgian friend how he um, felt resentment about uh, white people and the way they had treated him and others in the empire. But on reflection, he said, how could a whole race be made responsible for one man? My reasoning as I had was not strengthening, um, my reasoning as I had, was I not strengthening racial antagonism in the same Europe? There were men of heart who were working at the destruction of that ignorance, which kept the whole sections of humanity apart and were seeking human equality and brotherhood. Right, final slide, please. In 1919, uh, sorry, in 1999, um, Oxford University Press asked um, a lot of distinguished people around the world to reflect on what would happen in the 20th century. And Chinua Rashibi um, reflected on Du Bois. And he said what you can see on the screen. At the beginning of the 20th century, William Du Bois said that he hoped the issue of the 20th century would be race or the color line, as he called it. He was right but he probably assumed it would be solved by the end of the century. Well, it wasn't solved by the end of the century. Uh, that perhaps, well, it wasn't, and one hopes that perhaps it will be in the 21st century. And I hope that's all our hopes as well. Um, I, I talked to uh, Glenn Jordan about Black Lives Matter and what seemed to me to be a movement which is unprecedented. And he made the point to me, what's unprecedented about it is the number of white people who are involved in it. There have been plenty of black protests. Uh, so I've ended with the hashtag Black Lives Matter because they do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Neil. Uh, that was a very uh, important and insightful talk um, and a very important hope to end off with. So thank you so much for that. Um, for those of you who have questions for Neil, um, if you can just post them in the chat. Um, I'm sorry we haven't been able to get access to them throughout the talk, but if you would like to ask Neil a question, now would be the time to do so. Um, I, I had a few um, points, so if you're okay with Neil. Yeah, fine. Um, just in terms of really the, the sheer sort of transnational element of this, you know, and how important it is to understanding Cardiff um, and its wider context. And obviously that was throughout, you know, the talk that you've just gave. Um, how significant is it to understanding the conflict in a Welsh context, do you think, the, the transnational element of this? Well, uh, fundamental because, yeah. you know, Cardiff was one of the global ports, the biggest coal exporting port, well, you know, with 
Harry and but South Wales ports were the biggest coal exporting ports they they fueled the 19th century and one of the things I think we need to learn to do in Welsh history is not to think of it as having a, a distinct boundary around Wales and we can only be concerned with that I and mean, if we look at what Bill Jones has been doing, Alid Jones and what Paul O'Leary is doing about transnational history in Wales. I think they're at the cutting edge of what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bill is talking about Welsh people in the world, but there's the other story about people from the world coming in to Wales. And we should very much see that as part of Imperial South Wales, as um, Gwynalf called it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree. The it's, it's just fascinating to see these connections being made between Cardiff and Chicago, Trinidad, Belize, and all these different places. One, what, obviously, you know, we talked a lot about Cardiff. Um, do you feel as if the Newport riots and the Bay riots get less attention um, in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, they certainly do, and I'm probably guilty of it. I mean, I was today, I almost forgot to talk about them. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> no, it's um, in, in my original article in Slavir, it, it was meant to be Cardiff, and then I changed it to South Wales. Uh, there was nothing in Swansea, but there were significant outbreaks in Barrie and Newport. But as far as I'm aware, they don't have the kind of longer term effects. Neither of them has such a significant community as, as Butte Town. But there, there are conflicts in all the places at a, a lesser level in 1920, 21. Um, some of them are mentioned in the postscripts I wrote in my, to my article in Slavir and in other places that I've written about this. So, yes, I mean... <laughs> we could do with studies of the communities in Newport and um, Barry. Somebody um, did post quite a lot of material online on Newport in 1919 last year when it was all being commemorated. But, but yes, and I mean, you could say that about Newport in Welsh history generally, couldn't you? I mean, it, it's, um, it's remarkable that, um, you know, we don't really have a, a modern history of Newport yeah. and, well, uh, Andy Kroll's just done a book on Barry as a resort, which I haven't read yet, but is obviously very welcome. But yes, of course, it needs to be to go outside Cardiff. Yeah, I agree, yes, especially on Newport. As with, with my own research, um, is something that I think we need to focus more upon in terms of as a city, it, it's its history and all, all its elements. Um, so we, we we do have a question here from from Hal Davis. It says, how was repatriation carried out? by persuasion, by financial incitement, or by force? Were people rounded up at night? Uh, no, there was no force that mm. I'm aware of. There were financial inducements. Um, five pounds if you left and a pound on landing. It, it wasn't a great deal. I mean, I suppose that's five or six weeks work wages for somebody. Um, <clears throat> but it was seen as insufficient. But I think the key thing was that many people had families and relationships in Cardiff and they just didn't want to go. That was home, and quite rightly so. Some went, because you, you might... Um, <laughs> well, you'd understand it, wouldn't you? I mean, if you've been treated like that on the streets of Cardiff, I mean, it's not a place that you would particularly want to hang around, um, possibly. But no, most stayed, and... There are, there are never figures for these things. I think the uh, population of Cardiff probably, had, uh, you know, remained at wartime levels into the 1920s, 30s from the colonial areas. There's probably quite a turnover of it. Um, one of the things I think we always have to be careful about, when you say the population of a city is, say, 100,000, that it involves far more people than that. Over a decade, it might be twice as many people passing through it. It's always turning over. And I think you've got to be very suspicious of things like that. I mean, yeah. possibly half a million went through Cardiff in the course of the First World War. Yeah, the, mov the movement of people is just, <coughs> is just staggering in this context, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, we, another uh, sort of uh, comments last question from Theo Luco here. He says, greetings from the sister city of Liverpool. Um, I see a correlation between that time and now 
in that the disintegration of empire continues, notably in the US, with immigrants being scapegoats of the establishment and media. Do you foresee unrest on our streets again as inevitable, almost? Hmm. Um, I, I don't think in the form it took in 1919, which I think we should probably call a white riot, the white attacks on people of mm -hmm. color. Um, what we've seen in the United States and Britain in the post-war period essentially are ghetto rebellions, uh, which are very different. They're black people protesting and making comments. So it, it's what you have in Toxteth in uh, 1981 and you know, various other places. Um, so I think there can be conflicts like that. Um, there hasn't been a riot of that kind of in Britain since Middlesbrough in 1961, to the best of my knowledge. And in uh, the one in Detroit in 1943 in America is seen as the turning point because it's, it's got sort of elements of both. It's a kind of ghetto rebellion and a white riot at the same time. So there, there doesn't, don't seem to be the circumstances for that. But of course, there's plenty of uh, you know, individual assaults on people on the streets, you know, Stephen Lawrence and, and yeah. you know, everything else. But communal riots seem to me to be unlikely. Mm. I hope I'm right. <laughs> yeah. um, we have another question here. It's from a, a, it's, there's no name on this one, but um, it says, what was the role of women, including white women who married black men in Butte Town in all of this? Oh, well, extremely important because uh, issues of sexual relationships were uh, vital. And many people made the point, Kenneth Little at the time, that the community in Butte Town was, of course, highly diverse. But the common element was the local white women. It's a workforce of men. There are virtually no women of colour in Butte Town. The, the core of the community is the white women. Uh, of course, over time, they become people of mixed race ancestry and, um, uh, and, it, and it becomes a very diverse population. Mm -hmm. But the white women are vital and <laughs> they're treated very badly in the press. They're sometimes seen as former prostitutes who've you know, married uh, to... Uh, black people. Uh, I think there's, there's no evidence for that at all, but it's said in the press. They're seen as women of loose morals. Um, and uh, this goes on through the interwar period. I've written uh, something about it, but Simon Thomas, uh, Simon Jenkins, sorry, is, is doing uh, excellent work on this kind of thing in the interwar period. So they were demonized as people who, you know, were eager for sex. They, they had all the problems uh, of Cardiff heaped upon them. They're very important. I think really they were um, attracted to black men. Um, that, that was a perfectly normal thing. And, you know, many said, well, they're better husbands than a lot of white people. You know, if you were married to someone who was a Muslim, they, they don't drink and spend all the money in the pub, for instance. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an interesting um, way to look at it. You know, the gendered aspect of this, absolutely. Oh, um, gen gender is vital to yeah. it, but there, there aren't, in general terms, um, black women involved, mm -hmm. and the same is true of the Norwegians and others. There are marriage uh, statistics which you can look at, and it's clear that most of them, you know, there weren't enough Norwegian women for all the married men to have married. Uh, Norwegian, so they must have married out of the group, mm -hmm. and um, it's it, it, it's part of South Wales' heavy industry, isn't it? It's like coal mining, steel, and shipping. They're all male-dominated industries, mm -hmm. so that shapes the gender relationships. Yeah, and also the gender makeup of these cities and ports. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so uh, one final question we have here from Peter Dixon. Um, it says, "Thanks, Neil. Fascinating talk." Um, Southeast Asian sailors don't appear to be represented in this story. Is this because there were very few um, or there aren't figures available, for example? Um, there were Malays. Mm -hmm. um, 
And someone has written about them in Cardiff. I meant to check it. There was something put online in um, last year in the discussions of the riots. I can look that up. Um, but generally, there weren't very many in Cardiff. There weren't very many Laskas, as they were called, from the uh, west coast of India. Mm -hmm. um, they were important in Liverpool because the, the trade in Liverpool was opposite of Cardiff. It was liners. That is, they ran regular routes. And uh, in Cardiff, you have tramp shipping where the, the ship you know, might go to Rio de Janeiro and then somewhere else and you know, went looking around the world, tramping, looking for cargoes. Now, in Liverpool, they signed a lot of people on Lasker articles, as they were called, which meant that you signed on in India rather than in uh, Liverpool, and you could be paid lower wages. There were very few Laskers in Cardiff. Mm. Okay. Interesting. But um, so we, one thing I did want to sort of finish off, you mentioned about the, the uh, Rufus Fennell, for example. Yeah. And he said about the links to Paul Robeson. Can you, yeah. can you sort of talk a little bit more about that, if, if there is any inf other information? Oh, yeah. The, there's an article um, by um, Christian Holberg, um, in the journal Race and Class, which I've just discovered. And he's also written his entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. <laughs> and, uh, amazing, you know, this man of mystery for me 40 years ago, and now we know a lot about him, and most of what I thought I knew about him isn't true. Um, so there's a whole article, and he analyzes the script which he wrote for the, uh, for the film, which was never produced. Mm -hmm. But he appears in two films as well. Right. Okay. Which I haven't managed to see yet, but you can probably look at them online. The details are in the article. I can put the reference up. Um, and I, I've been in touch with him in the last week or so, um, Christian, who, who wrote the article. Um, and Fennell seems to have gone from, yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. how the Western Mail, I think, said you pronounce it. James Ernest, who knew him, uh, called him Fennell. But uh, I, I think. <laughs> Probably it was Fennell. Um, he went from place to place, and he's hard to track down. He's certainly in the American Army for a time. Um, he claimed to have been um, a medical orderly or something in uh, Mesopotamia and in mm -hmm. um, uh, Gallipoli, but I don't think there's any clear evidence for it. I, mm. No, it's, it's just it's, it's fascinating connections um, to be made there with Paul Robeson. It ties really nicely, I think, with our next event um, on Paul Robeson, I guess. Yeah. But um, that's, that's, yeah. for, that's for another time, I guess. But anyway, I, Nick, I can, I'll send Howell a copy of the article where yeah. he's doing it so they can look at those connections. Sure, sure. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think that's it. We're, we're at the end of um, today's yeah. event. Um, yeah. So thank you once again, Neil. That was that was wonderful. Thank you so much you. for for that talk. Indeed. I'll pass yeah. it back over to Ian now. Ian. Yeah, that, and absolutely. That, that that was brilliant, Neil. Um, thank you. On behalf of everyone, uh, I'd like to extend our grateful thanks to you for offering us such a an insightful, erudite, meticulously researched presentation uh, on the Cardiff uh, race riots, seen within the wider historical context. Um, one of the striking features, I think we'd all agree, was the, the, re the original sources that you used there. They were of um, considerable illustrative in interest. Thanks very much. Many thanks. Thanks very Many much. Thanks for us. Yeah. Sorry, thanks for asking me to do it. And... <laughs> On the thanks, many thanks also to all of you for joining us today, uh, for your comments and questions via chat. Grateful thanks to my fellow Slava uh, committee members, James, Darren, Matthew, Sean, Colin, for helping organize the event. Just to let you know, for those of you who attended our previous online event on 1st of August on Wales and slavery, We've arranged a uh, follow-up Q&A session with our three excellent speakers, uh, Chris Evans, Marion Gwynn, and Audrey West. This will be taking place on Wednesday, the 26th of August at 7 p.m. As usual, full details will be posted uh, soon on the Slava website and Twitter page. 
and will also be emailed out to Slava members. Um, while we're on the subject of membership, once again, it's been great to see a number of new members sign up uh, to Slava over the past few weeks. If I can just be allowed uh, one more membership plug, if you are not yet a member of Slava, I do hope you will consider joining us. Uh, details of how to subscribe can be found on our website um, at a, an inflation busting price of £15. Many thanks once again and hopefully see you at the next event. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>